Since biblical times, man has witnessed and recorded strange manifestations in the sky and speculated on the possibilities of visitors from another world. Today, from the skies of California, the fields of Kansas, the rice paddies of the Orient, the air lanes of the world, come persistent reports of UFOs, unidentified flying objects which we have come to know as flying saucers. In Dayton, Ohio, the Air Intelligence Command gathers and sifts data from all quarters of the globe. Ninety-seven percent of the objects prove on investigation to be of natural origin, while three percent still are listed as unknown. The Air Force is aware of the widely held belief that some of these could be flying saucers from another planet. While there is nothing conclusive in the evidence, the probing and digesting of information about UFOs continues unceasingly. As a result, headquarters of the Hemispheric Defense Command in Colorado Springs issued an order. All military installations are to fire on sight at any flying objects not identifiable. But even as they did so, the military wondered whether their scientific know-how and their best weapons would be effective in any battle of the Earth versus the flying saucers. July 16, to Internal Security Commission, Ray Skyhook. Summary and progress report from Project Director, Dr. Russell A. Marvin. And Mrs. Dr. Russell A. Marvin, without whose inspiration and untiring criticism, this report could never have been written. Married two hours, and already she's claiming community property. Now that you're married, Dr. Marvin, you don't have to sneak up on me. You always did have eyes in the back of your head. Besides, it's not safe when you're driving. But pretty. I thought intellectual giants were supposed to be backwards and shy. My third grade teacher, Miss Hickey, said I was a quick study. You're starting something you're not going to be able to finish. Yeah. Yeah, today I've got a hot date with a three-stage rocket. Well... Now, please, no interruptions. Because of recent scientific advances, it is now possible to realize an ancient dream, the exploration of outer space. To prepare for this great stride forward, we are assembling data on conditions at atmospheric levels beyond those hitherto explored. To collect the necessary data, Unmanned automatic observation posts are being sent up in multiple stage rockets to a distance hundreds of miles above the Earth's surface. There, swinging in endless orbits around our planet, will be 12 tiny man-made satellites, or moons. They will report to us by radio, thus providing primary information needed to prepare the way for our ascent into space. The effects of gravitational loss, showers of meteoric dust, the fierce and undiluted heat of the sun, the cosmic radiation, all will be studied and analyzed. At the present time, we have launched 10 of the artificial satellites, or birds as we call them. We... Do you hear something? 
Hear what? I don't hear. Shh, listen. was a saucer. A flying saucer? Well, we saw what appeared to be a flying saucer. That's all we can say. We saw it. We heard it, both of us. What more do we need to know? Well, we have to have time to think, to evaluate this, before we sound off. Let, let me have a light. Of course, it wasn't a saucer at all. I just shake like this all the time. afterwards. Well, that's... That's one piece of concrete evidence. Rocket number 11 will be launched in 20 minutes. Oh, we'll leave it for now. Come on, we just got time to get to the bunker. General Hanley reporting to Project Skyhook. Now make it fast, will you? I'm in a hurry. Nobody allowed in, sir. There's a rocket taking off now. That's what I want to stop. Let me speak to Dr. Russell Marvin. Westgate to bunker number two. Dr. Marvin. Bunker number two, Marvin speaking. This is the Westgate, sir. General Hanley wants you. Oh, put him on. Carol, it's your father. Calling from Panama? No, right here at the project. Hello, Russ. Hello. Well, welcome home, General. What's the news from Panama? It's bad, I'm afraid. I think you want to hear what I found before you send up another rocket. Can you possibly put it off? Well, I'm afraid I can't. We're tied to a definite schedule of launchings. Wait a minute. Uh, there's something else I wanted. Uh, just a minute. It's your privilege. Hi, Dad. What is it, honey? I just wanted to hear your voice and... Tell you, Russ and I were married last night. Married? Oh, forgive us for not letting you know, darling. I've got to hang up. Let's have dinner tonight. Can you? Don't forget.
I know how the designer feels hearing a thing like this. But Project Skyhook hasn't worked out the way the Defense Department hoped. Tell me, how many birds have you sent up so far? Eleven, counting today's. And how many are you in contact with right now? Just one, today's. I admit we haven't been able to track them visually so far, but we'll correct that. Don't be too sure of that. Well, we can certainly tune them in if they're up there. What I'm trying to tell you is that they're no longer up there. That wasn't a meteorite that fell on Panama. It was the burned remains of number seven. I made sure of that myself. What? And intelligence has reports now which convince us that one and three fell over Africa, number five around the North Pole, and nine and ten along the Andes. The rest can be presumed to have been lost someplace at sea. What happens to them? Apparently, they blow up in outer space. Why? There's nothing explosive in them. You can take it from me. When a rocket's blasted off, it should circle the Earth for a long time. That is, unless... Yes, Dad? Unless what? Unless someone, something shoots them down as fast as we set them up there. <laughs> Why, no gun in the world can shoot that high. No. No, of course not. Bring spoons for your coffee. Ah, my special barbecue. Mm hmm That's to make up for not telling you about our getting married. It was kind of sudden for us, too. Sudden? I've only been after him for a year. I don't need to tell you, both of you, how pleased I am. Well, I'm glad of that. I wouldn't like it very much if you weren't. Thank you. Russ, what were you driving at back there about something shooting down one of the satellites? General, we saw a strange thing this afternoon. We saw what appeared to be a flying saucer. A flying saucer? It nearly ran into us. You're sure of it? Both Carol and I are subject to the same atmospheric disturbances that may have affected other observers. But there is a qualitative difference when you're a scientist. We do have one piece of supporting evidence. An accidental recording of the sounds it made. The tape is in the lab at the project. I'd like you to hear it tomorrow. You both saw this? Yes. Excuse me. I'm Captain Holloway, sir. Okay. Will you stand here, please? Who's Holloway? He's on monitor duty this evening. They've just lost contact with number 11. Oh, Russ, I'm sorry. Is it still in range of our receivers? If it hasn't been knocked down... Look! What are those lights? They're what the pilots call fool lights. St. Elmo's fire in ancient times. Superstitious regard them as omens of things to come. The best science has been able to make out of them is that they're electric particles agitated by moving air. Same principle as the aurora borealis. There have been so many around the project the last couple of days, we all just take them for granted. Bird 11 ought to be visible in the sky right now, and it's second lap around the world. Look! There it is! Was that it? Yes. Well, surely you're not going to send up number 12 tomorrow after this. I have to. Why? With the television pickup, cameras, and microphone, I should have done it before. This time, I'm going to know what's happening up there and know the reason why. Come on, let's finish our dinner. Checking TV pickup. Getting a good image? Fine. TV's okay. I'll be down in a couple of minutes. Tell them to hurry it up. Hey, do you notice anything different since you were here last? Soundproofing? That's right. You could fire a cannon off outside and you couldn't hear a thing down here. Hmm. Number 12, okay for takeoff. Well, there's an old rocket man from way back. I'd rather watch from ground level. Dr. Marvin. Dr. Marvin. Marvin here. Yeah. 
You getting ready for a scene? Well, Russ and I are going to take turns monitoring this one ourselves. For days, if necessary. Soundproof privacy. And the last word in scientific solitude. Happy honeymoon, darling. Thanks, Dad. Prepare rocket for launching. Prepare rocket for launching. Rocket number 12 will be launched in five minutes. Four minutes to zero. Check. Take it up at zero, Major Kimberly. Okay. Stand by. Observation Tower A, come in. Evans, radar to Tower A. Observation Tower A, Sergeant Nash. UFO due west, approaching fast. What does it look like? Can't tell yet. I'll call when I get a better reading on my scope. Do that. As you were, Sergeant. Unidentified flying object reported due west, sir. Probably a buzzer. Sergeant Nash, observation tower A. What? Forget it, Walters. This is no time for gags. It's two minutes to zero. The sentry at West Gate has spotted a flying saucer, sir. Evans, radar to tower A. Tower A, Nash. I get a better reading on my scope, Sergeant. That UFO is over the West Sentry post. Does it look like a flying saucer, Evans? Yes, it does. Skyhook control to approaching object. What is it? I wouldn't know. Connect me with Dr. Marvin's lab. Mine's dead. Dead. Operator doesn't answer. Look. What's happening? I don't know. I... Thank you. 
They'll... They'll dig us out. Speaking to you through the translating device above your head. Can you understand us? Yes. And I hope you can understand me. Whoever you are, whatever you are, you'll regret what you did at the project. Perhaps you can explain why, after contacting Dr. Marvin, we were met with violence. You've contacted Dr. Marvin? We spoke to him. All he heard was meaningless sounds. The same kind of sounds I just heard. We had hoped a sufficient adjustment for the time differential between us would have been made. I don't understand. Evidently, you do not realize you are in an interstellar conveyance. You are already outside the atmosphere of your own planet. As a prisoner, all I am required to tell you is that I am General John Hanley of the United States Army. These are all the facts leading up to the rocket explosion at Operation Skyhook. To the best of our knowledge, my wife and I are the only ones left alive, since we have not seen or heard anyone for hours. The air is becoming toxic. In the event of our death, this report, together with the recording of the saucer sounds on this tape, constitute all the data we have. The batteries are failing. The recorder's not running up to speed. This is Dr. Russell A. Marvin. Russ? Where are you? It's all right, honey. The gas generator stopped, that's all. Close. I'm afraid of the darkness. Dr. Russell Marvin. The tape. It is very urgent that we meet. We will appear tomorrow at Operation Skyhook when your son is exactly over your That's the sound of the saucer we heard on the tape. The message was sent at an accelerated speed, so it just sounded like gibberish to us. When the batteries died, the tape slowed down, and the voice became clear. If I'd only figured it out before... Maybe we wouldn't have been trapped down here. What had stuffed out hundreds of lives and leveled an installation worth millions of dollars? An aroused public demanded an answer, and the federal government dedicated the strength of all its branches to the task of finding one. However, when Dr. Marvin and his wife were rescued, 
The answer was to be found in the experience of the only two human survivors and in a reel of tape recording they carried to Washington, D.C. and the Pentagon. There can't be any doubt about what it means. A landing at the project was proposed on the day of the disaster. There was to have been a meeting. If I couldn't keep the appointment, a message was to be sent on a designated wavelength by ordinary shortwave transmission. Does anyone want to have the recording played again? You've heard it a dozen times. My wife and I, for three days and nights, have been telling what we knew. We've been before every committee, commission, and review board in Washington. It's time we decided to do something. The tape is by no means conclusive. It certainly doesn't prove that your so-called flying saucer caused the destruction of Operation Skyhook. I grant you that. A strange voice, a set of instructions that might have come from anywhere. Well, has anyone a better idea of what happened? Personally, I'm inclined to accept Dr. Marvin's conclusion about the connection between the message and the disaster. All right, so am I. Then why not let me try to contact them, meet them? Find out what this is all about. If we are to be confronted with a hostile and unknown power, any decision to meet with them must be made at the cabinet level. Well, I just hope that while we're waiting, another disaster doesn't occur. We're pressing for the earliest possible action. The Secretary of State is flying back from Europe. The Secretary of Defense is returning from the Pacific. If a meeting could be arranged in the meantime, the only risk would be to me. I feel personally responsible for what happened. I was in charge. Hundreds of lives were lost. My own wife's father. If I had the authority, I'd grant it to you, but we will have to wait. But I promise you that we will recommend that you be authorized to make radio contact and meet with... with whoever they are. Are we through for the night? Yes. But we are going to ask you to remain at your hotel. You mean I'm under detention? Maybe needed at any time. Major Hudlin is assigned as your liaison. Good night. Good night. Dr. Marvin. Dr. Marvin, I don't like this watchdog routine any better than you do. I'm under orders. I have a job to do. We're both on the same side. I'm sorry. I'm just tired and worried. I know. Well, you were in there. You heard both sides. Who do you agree with? I agree with you as far as the urgency is concerned, but they're right, too. They're responsible to a chain of command. They have to be careful. And this thing may be too big to allow for mistakes. Russell Marvin calling on 225.6 megacycles. Over. Dr. Russell Marvin calling on 225.6 megacycles as per instructions. Are you listening? If you hear me, please reply. I am tuned in on the same wavelength. Over. We hear you, Dr. Marvin, and we understand you. Do you understand us? Yes. Who are you? Listen. It is now 9.30 a.m. Earth time. Greenwich Meridian time. We will be waiting at exactly 11 a.m. at the shore of the Chesapeake Bay where the North Beach Road reaches the sea. Do not raise an alarm and keep this appointment. Listen to me. I can't keep the appointment. I'm under orders. I'll be able to meet you in a few days. Do you hear me? Over. Russ? 
Hello, hello. Dr. Russell Marvin calling on 225.6 megacycles. Do you hear me? Please come in. Over. 11 o'clock Greenwich time. It will be 6 o'clock here. I can just make it. You're not going. I heard you say you're under orders. I didn't arrange this meeting. I just asked them to wait. Who ordered that radio? I did today. I was hoping they'd give me the go-ahead and let me use it. You can't go. I've already lost Dad. You shouldn't have called them. Well, maybe I shouldn't have. And maybe I should. But it started now. And I've got to go through with it. But it's not your job alone. Oh, call someone. Call me. Call me. Room 312, Major Hugland, hurry, please. Hello? Yes. Yes? Thanks. Well, call the garage. Tell them not to give him a car. Well, tell them, tell him he's sick, anything, out of his mind. I'll be right down to take care of it. Sure thing, Mrs. Marvin. Frank, may I have my car, please? Gee, Dr. Marvin, I, I can't. I was talking to your wife on the phone, and, and she said that... I... But, Dr. Marvin, I can't let you have the car. I... Get out of my way, Frank. Please, Dr. Marvin, I don't want to lose my job. Oh. <laughs> Back with us. I'm sorry, but I have to do my job. Let's go back. Please come in. Come on, let's get out of here. No, wait. With your friends, Dr. Marvin. With you. Please come in, all of you. I'm going to phone headquarters. You'd better do as they say.
We must be thousands of miles away from the Earth. And in a matter of seconds. You are many miles away from your planets. But not in a matter of seconds. Listen to your watch, Dr. Marvin. Stopped. It's supposed to be anti-magnetic. We generate a magnetic field stronger than the gravitational field on your Earth. This is the principle by which we move through space. We have adjusted the magnetic field to compensate for the normal loss of gravitational effect and atmospheric pressure. But your watch hasn't stopped. Feel your pulse. I haven't any. Neither have I. We operate in a very different time reference. You might say all this is happening between the ticks of your watch or the beats of your heart. And that's why we... we couldn't decipher your message till it was too late. It made it necessary for us to defend ourselves at Skyhook. Then you shot down our 11 rockets. Why? At that time, we had no way of knowing they were only primitive observation posts. We thought they might be weapons directed against us. Who are you? Where are you from? Because of your leadership in exploring the field of outer space, we felt you could best understand that we are the survivors of a disintegrated solar system. At this moment, the remainder of our fleet is circling your globe. a signal to tell them where to land. What do you want with me? Arrange for your world leaders to confer with us in the city of Washington. They may not listen. I'm only a scientist. We will show you how important it is to convince your leaders. In an instant of your time, we travel from beyond your moon to the surface of your Earth. and force. With a weapon like that, why don't you just land and take over? To do that would cause worldwide panic. Despite our power, the few of us would be busy indefinitely trying to suppress a large hostile population. In the end, we would be masters of a wrecked and hungry planet. What makes you think you'll conquer us without a fight? We felt it would be best to meet with you so fighting could be avoided. Such agreements have been made on Earth before. How do you know so much about us? We have the means of accumulating information. If you wish to convince yourself about our detailed knowledge, test us. Any question? What's the size of the armed forces of the United States? There's approximately three and one half million men. Well, what team has won the most World Series? The New York Yankees. Who was the first president of the United States? Why? I know that voice. Who are you? John Hammond. My father. What have you done to him? You have been addressing General Henry's mind, not General Henry. Look behind you. Dad. He will not recognize you. He has been subjected to a machine we call an infinitely indexed memory bank. We have transferred all knowledge from his brain to our machine. Thus, we have available and readily accessible his total experience. We can do this to as many as we like and learn whatever we must know. Oh, stop it. Please stop it. That gun away. Don't look at that.
This is the beginning of the process by which we read the brain for the infinitely indexed memory bank. What have you done with my father? We will return him to you eventually. And the police officer, too. Will you arrange a conference for us? We will tell the authorities you want one. That's all we can do. I'm not going to cooperate with these monsters. It may take weeks or months to set it up. You will have two of your lunar days, or 56 days Earth time. Let them kill us now and be done with. Please, Carol. If our officials don't believe me, I can't be held responsible. When you tell of the destroyer being sunk, refer to latitude 30 degrees 20 minutes, longitude 45 degrees 15 minutes. They will believe you. Well, suppose Major Hudlin, my wife, myself, were all hysterical, or hypnotized, or whatever you're thinking, that we never saw what these fiends did to General Hanley or the police officer. How do you explain the destroyer? There's word that the Atlantic fleet has lost contact with the vessel in the area, but there's no confirmation of a sinking. However, we're continuing to check. You realize, of course, you are contacting the saucer in the first place, violated our instructions. This itself may have placed the safety of the entire country in jeopardy. Now that the damage is done, and assuming your story is verified, are you proposing that we meet with these, these creatures and yield to their demands? And why Washington? If they want to parley with the whole world, why do they choose the capital of the United States? They appear to be realists, and Washington is one of the centers of political power. What about our atomic and hydrogen weapons? Wouldn't they be effective against these saucers? I'd like to answer that question, sir, if I may. Our atomic weapons might be effective if we could deliver them. But to use nuclear power when they land would destroy our own cities. And then we don't know whether they are vulnerable or not. In answer to your question, Mr. Cassidy, I've learned a little about their mode of operation. And I've got an idea for a new kind of weapon. It's only a guess, of course. A new weapon in less than 56 days? I have an idea for an ultrasonic gun. With enough scientific and engineering help, we could construct a working model in a very short time. Maybe it'll work. If not, we'll know soon enough. And in the meantime, you'll be working on every other means of defense. We have no choice but to use every conceivable weapon if they land. Gentlemen, please. The destroyer Franklin Edison was sunk at latitude 30 degrees, 20 minutes, longitude 45 degrees, 15 minutes, at approximately 0600. We are expected at the White House in an hour for a policy decision that will probably involve not only our own country, but the entire world. Whatever the decisions, you may be certain that you'll be given every assistance in testing your theory. I suggest you start to work right away. Major Hudlin, we'll make arrangements for whatever facilities you may require. Thank you. Hello. How's it going? Well, instead of turning electric impulses into ultra-high-frequency sound, we nearly burned the place up about an hour ago. What? All right, let's try it out on the cement block. All the way. your generator. But it worked for us. It worked, didn't it? We know what hit Skyhook. What? Sound. Sound? <laughs> Having two small boys around the house, I know that noise doesn't do a man much good, but burn him up, knock his house down? Well, the sound I had in mind was of a higher wave frequency than we've ever been able to produce. Then you mean we've got the weapon? No, I'm afraid not. With the best materials and circuits available, all we've succeeded in doing is pulverizing the end of a cement block. The theory is beautiful. We don't have the tools and the materials to make it work. Maybe in 10 years, five, even two. How many days left? 27. Russ, remember that report from Dr. Patek in New Delhi? He suggested a different approach. Instead of attempting to duplicate the ultrasonic devices of our visitors, we try to interrupt their magnetic field 
by projecting a highly intermittent induced electrical field. Now, suppose we take this... Of one course! Here. We cut the ultrasonic wavelength into the circuit and knock them down like clay pitch. Not so fast, Raj. You know, it can it. work. It can work. Here, Major, yes. get on the phone. We'll need the largest portable generator that's connected he makes. From all parts of the globe, under top priority, came every facility and scientific help the governments of the world could furnish. Dr. Marvin and his staff assembled these necessary materials in a concealed laboratory, where they were to translate a short experience in a craft from outer space into a formula, then plans, and finally, a functioning reality. It's only a hollow steel ball, but for our purposes, it's a flying saucer. You can start up the generator now. The magnet does that, doesn't it? The magnetic attraction above is enough to counteract the pull of gravity from below. Go ahead. It was your idea. You be the first to try it. My idea, nonsense. It was just as much yours and Dr. Patix in India and a dozen other scientists all over the world. Come on. It works. It works fine. Ross, look. kind of thing that's watched us since the beginning of the project. Watched who? Russ and all the developments of the rocket program. I always thought it was St. Elmo's fire. I'll have to change my mind about that. Well, whatever it was, the saucer sent it down to find out what we're doing. We have television. They may have some totally different device that serves the same purpose. We'd better get to Washington before they decide to drop in on us. Major, give cutting a hand and load that gun on the generator truck. Right. Never mind the files, Professor. I'll take the diagrams. <laughs> We ought to be in Washington in about an hour. I hope they haven't spotted us. Let's pull away from the lab. Come on. Over. They're sending a bomber. We ought to go on with those diagrams as quickly as we can. I'll get them from Russ. I'll go with you. Fire up the generator. We're going to see if this gun really works. What's the matter? Can't get this blast of thing started. All right. Russ, getting you and the plans to Washington is more important than anything else. Right. She's right if this machine works. If not, it doesn't make any difference. We 
just get a little more power. Russ, let's go, please. Before it's too late. circling overhead and the saucer will stay away. as a feather. Humanoid and ancient. These suits must serve as an electronic and mechanical outer skin. Take the place of their atrophied flesh and muscles. get this to a lab.
Oh, you hear Dr. and Mrs. Marvin now. Carol, Russ, we've been waiting for you. Thanks. This is Dr. Alberts. How do you do? You know General Edmonds? Yes, Admiral Edmonds. Right. Certainly. And Mrs. Marvin is General Hanley's daughter. Mrs. Marvin, your father's death was a great loss to all of us. Thank you. Well, I see you've been busy. Oh, we've been doing a little work. Here, let me show you. It didn't take too long to break this thing down. These helmets have a language translating device in them. Mrs. Marvin, would you say something into the microphone? The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. Shakespeare wouldn't like it. <laughs> Professor Albert said if we read the dictionary into the device, word by word, we'd have a translation of those words into their language. By translating their communications into our words, we were able to decode them. Professor Alberts requisitioned the electronic translator, which his university had developed, and the results, to say the least, have been startling. We've recorded a number of their messages on tape. One of the messages appears to be a plan of attack. The rest were operational routine. I'll show you how it works. Over here. We can expect trouble when Mercury is in perihelion. When will that be? It happens twice every three months. The information is too vague to be of any use to us. And the Sun in Con Polaris? That implies an orbital relation between the star Polaris and the Sun. We've never been able to figure it out. The blanks probably refer to their time computation. But these messages do involve the Sun. Palomar and the other observatories are watching it around the clock. In the meantime, we have a newer and stronger version of our interference machine on the drawing boards at Aberdeen. Has there been any determination of the weapon's useful range? There's a weakness. Our instruments indicate that the potential effect drops off sharply after 1,500 yards. We'll have to hope that that's enough. Well, maybe we'll be ready for them when they come. Has anyone tried that helmet on? Yes, we have. I think you'd be interested. Try it. It weighs only a few grams. What's it made of? We don't know exactly. Solidified electricity is the fancy name given to it by the Bureau of Standards. It resists everything we used on it, including the most extreme temperatures. It makes me Superman, for one thing. Yes, we know. I have a peculiar range of vision. I can also hear a young man just outside that window discussing a problem in advanced biology. Carol, would you see if I'm right? So I took her home when I kissed her goodnight and slapped my face. So I said, what's the idea? I didn't slap yours when you ordered a four dollar steak for dinner. You know, just as we need glasses and hearing aids, these people need electronic amplification of all their senses, especially sight and hearing. Does that suggest anything to you? They have their weaknesses. When will we be ready? We'll need at least a couple of weeks. People of Earth, attention. People of Earth, attention. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. Look to your sun for a warning. Look to your sun for a warning. Following eruptions on your sun, there will be eight days and nights of meteorological convulsion. Turn it down. Soon thereafter, they're arrogant enough. We will land in their schedule in advance. They're coming down to take over. They made that clear to us in the saucer. They can move so fast and strike so hard, they ought to be able to sneak in and flatten us. 
They expect to terrify us with a display of power. They're contemptuous of our defenses. People of the earth, attention. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of... If I'm right, they'll sail into Washington in broad daylight. They expect us to capitulate when they land. Speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. People of Earth, attention. People of Earth, attention. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. This is a voice speaking to you from thousands of miles beyond your planet. Look to your son for a warning. Look to your son. It's for coming over everywhere. Following eruptions on your son, there will be eight days and nights of meteorological convulsions. Soon thereafter, and he can mobilize the whole country. In the capital city of the United States, the whole world. Let all nations be represented in Washington to confer with us. You are suspicious, and there's the man. And I'll come with other Russians that need those. Tell me. La crise est jumelée à part sur planète. Dans la capitale des États-Unis d'Amérique, si on nous représentait en Washington, par contre. Et dans le monde, la soleil du monde, c'est le lumin en Washington. People of Earth, attention. In every country of the world, in every language, every means of electronic communication was jammed with the message. The warning was dinned into the ears of the Earth's population unceasingly for 12 hours. And after the twelfth hour, silence. Then, a tremendous explosion on the surface of the sun. Nine days. That must be what the missing words meant. I get the picture, thanks. If I need any more information, I'll call you back. Goodbye. That was the Bureau of Meteorology. As we know, sunspots have a direct effect upon our weather. We can expect heavy storms, tidal waves, hurricanes. When? Beginning now and continuing for eight days. That's when we most need our communications and transport. We'll have to work under the worst possible conditions to prepare for an attack. What's the schedule, General? You're working on the installation of the interference units. Our plans for evacuating the city are already underway. Then it's been decided that we'll fight? When an armed and threatening power lands uninvited in our capital, we don't meet him with tea and cookies. There's a job of production expediting waiting for me. I don't believe further discussion will solve our problem. Before we break up, I would remind you that we have nine days left. One of those days is already half gone. Call it that. Is my bag packed? Mm -hmm. Mine too. What time do we leave? I have to leave right now. I'm going to Aberdeen to supervise the interference project. So that wasn't a hello kiss at all. It was goodbye. For a little while. You're going to have to leave town. They're evacuating Washington. Where am I going? Palm Springs. Remember the place I told you about? Mm hmm. We were going there together. I know. You're playing these tonight. Russ, let me stay. Maybe I can help. There's nothing more you can do. Here's your ticket. You will arrive before the bad weather sets in. And I'll be there soon. of man's vital communications to suffer were the shipping lanes and airways, then transport by rail and highway ground to a halt. When the telephone and telegraph systems had failed and the radio networks were forced to bear the burden alone, they too succumbed to interference known to originate in an increasing disturbance in the sun. The world, crippled by these events, waited for the first sign of an invasion from outer space. Because of the atmospheric violence, it was not until the ninth day that an orderly evacuation of the city of Washington could be attempted. 
Although the authorities and the military worked miracles, when the tenth day dawned, more than 60% of the people of Washington were still in the metropolitan area. Nick, he's at CIC. Yes, sir. Mrs. Marvin. Your husband told me you were in Palm Springs. The plane schedules were canceled before I could get away. Have you heard from Russ? There's been practically no communication with Aberdeen. Wires are down, radio jammed. But I'm expecting a courier any minute. Red alert. low over the Atlantic, coming in fast. from Aberdeen are taking up positions in the city. Your husband's section is nearing the Pentagon. Thanks. HQ. The saucer hidden down in the Potomac. Keep it in your field so it can't fire at us. you gone to GHQ calling all HF units. GHQ calling all HF units. Saucer hovering vicinity White House and Capitol.
Also now landing, vicinity, White House. Attention all units. Sounds like they're jamming them. Dr. Marvin, we've made contact with GHQ. GHQ to all HF units' attention. Saucer has landed in front of Capitol Building. All HF units' attention. GHQ to all HF units. Thank <laughs> you. 
Keep firing at saucers. ordered Project Skyhook rebuilt, and the space exploration program continued under the direction of Dr. Russell A. Marvin. The United Nations Assembly voted unanimously today to award a gold medal to Dr. Marvin. And to Mrs. Marvin goes a gold medal from Dr. Marvin for her love, courage, devotion, etc., etc., etc. Russ, do you think there are any more? Will they come back again? Not on such a nice day. And not to such a nice world. I'm glad it's still here. And still ours. <laughs> 